Welcome to the Big Mike Fund Podcast, where you'll learn about advanced wealth building strategies from real estate investing to creating massive ROI and secured retirement profits. So pour yourself a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, and lean in, because Big Mike has got the mic, starting now. Welcome to the Big Mike Fund Podcast. I'm the Big Mike, Mike Zlotnik. Today it is my distinct pleasure and a privilege to welcome Francis Newton Stacy. Hi, Francis. Hi, Mike. Uh, you were previously a guest on a podcast, and I'm honored to have you back. So thank you kindly for coming back uh, to be a guest on the podcast. My pleasure. So j just once again, give the audience a little bit about you, and I'm, uh, I I'm just going to introduce you first. Uh, you are a uh, frequent speaker on Fox Business. Uh, CNBC. You just appeared recently as a guest with Maria Bartiromo. Uh, I, I do. I did see you on um, CMB. Uh, CBS. Uh, sorry, yeah, CBS. CBS uh, Network. And uh, it's uh, it's fascinating how you can speak on very complex financial topics uh, in such a simple manner, explaining to the average Joe uh, what's happening out there today. So, uh, again, I'm honored to have you back. Uh, just two or three words about you. I, uh, you still live in Reno, Nevada? Is it still your yes, we, neck of the woods? My husband and I divorced California successfully. <laughs> so I haven't been in Reno in, in the last several months. We actually, um, my husband's in the auto racing industry, and uh, we came to Florida for the races in January and February. There are several races. There's an Indy car race in St. Petersburg. There's the 24 hours of Daytona, which actually went through. That was before COVID. And then the 12 hours of Sebring. And then um, the lockdown and all the COVID stuff started. The races were canceled. And I just remember, I think it was like March 13th or something, um, the Indy car race in St. Petersburg was canceled. And we just decided, you know what, let's just hang in Florida for just a little bit until this chaos passes. Well, we're still in Florida. <laughs> we we haven't uh, we haven't gotten up the courage to get back on the airplane with the puppy dog and everything. So uh, I think we're going to be going home in the next few weeks, though. I sincerely hope so. And uh, Florida is a good place to be uh, now, especially this time of the year. It's it's not too hot, not too cold. It's hopefully very pleasant where you are at. Yeah, it was funny. I was in uh, Washington D.C. in New York. At the end of February, actually February 20th, right before all of this occurred. And it was so, I remember I was in New York and my face was burning walking down the sidewalk. It was so cold. So I was so excited to come back down to Florida where it was mildly cold. But yeah, it's now getting hot here. So it's time to go back to Reno and dry air instead of the humidity. But yeah, it's been a very interesting thing. We just decided to stay down here and it kind of kept getting, we didn't know how long it was going to be. I think we would have gone home more quickly had we known, but you know, hindsight being 2020, we uh, live in Reno, Nevada, but we've been spending our COVID in Florida. That's fascinating. And, and I, I do know that the racing has, has restarted and uh, I'm sure your husband is excited to have uh, racing, uh, racing back to business. Yes, no. And, and I think he's doing a lot of work with the IMSA series this year. And I think they're starting back in August. This is going to be the first race. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully there's no second wave, um, and yeah, he'll be back to business. He's been watching a lot of the iRacing, and actually some of his drivers have been driving the iRacing, so it's kind of fun to watch. Yeah, yeah, I, I've seen this on TV a couple of last few days or whenever. They, they start running the uh, uh, events without any audience, without any, any fans, which is brave new world. But well, first they did the iRacing, it was like video game, the video game racing, and, and how – how precise they were about each of the tracks and where every tree and every corner and every bump was, was just incredible to watch. But yeah, of course now they're racing with no audience. I mean, he'll be back as part of the pit crew, um, you know, being an engineer and stuff like that. But yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I'm glad they're starting back up again. I'm glad, um, I'm glad that these industries are taking some initiative to getting back to normal. I think if we look back, you know, years, um, I think that that will be the right decision. Uh, so, continuing on this thought, um, so what do you feel? You, you, you are, uh, you're both an economist, uh, a, a Fed policy specialist, uh, 
So what do you think is, is happening in the real economy right now? We're, we're coming back, uh, things are beginning to reopen, uh, but the unemployment figures is huge. They, they, they are going through the roof and it feels like the economy is sort of uh, is still going down the hills while the stock market is doing its happy dance. <laughs> right. <laughs> They're definitely more disconnected than ever, aren't they? Um, let's let's That's start right. out with the economy. That's let's start out with jobless claims. I mean, there's some good news in the jobless claims this morning. Um, the fact that the weekly claims continues to be kind of on this declining curve is is great. You know, it's funny. Historically, markets tend to um, bottom before you get peak jobless claims, and we did see that here. Um, so. We did see that the markets bottomed before we got peak job, jobless claims because we had that peak number of about 6 million in March. Um, but now the jobless claims are continuing to decline. That's good news. The other good news is that the continuing claims are continuing to decline. So that's nice. So you've got about 4 million people who are not still on their claims that are getting back to work. The bad news is that if history is any indicator, and I think so far history hasn't been much of an indicator in this particular pandemic, um, but just historically speaking, um, from, from the jobless perspective, 42% of those claims go, may go from temporary to permanent job losses. That would be terrible. Um, they're talking about guesstimates of coming out with a 20% unemployment mark. If you kind of say, well, about 42% of those are going to maybe be permanent, you kind of land somewhere in the sort of 8% unemployment range, which is, of course, right around where we were in the global financial crisis. Um, so then, you know, what you're having there is you still have a very, very, very high unemployment. I think the thing is, is that it's going to be from the lower echelon of the economy, which gives further departure from the asset prices. But those are sort of good news. But things that could kind of hit the job market going forward to kind of watch out for. Number one, if we get a second wave of COVID, um, Trump has already come out and said he's not shutting down the economy, even if we get a second wave. Um, I think you know, knowing what we know now, that probably does make some sense because some of the less, you know, the less dense areas were not hit as badly, so they may not need to be shut down. Some of the more dense areas, maybe you would slow activity again to keep from having the spread, but that's to be debated, of course, politically. Um, some of the states still have backlogs on the jobs. They're not that remarkable in that I think they're going to move these numbers very much. Uh, New York is estimated to be about 44,000, Oregon's 25,000. These are not huge numbers in the millions as, that are going to change the curve when these claims go through. Um, you know, good news is the states have kind of, many of the states have overhauled their technology and had a lot of the big tech companies participate in streamlining the unemployment process. So if we do have a second wave, that might be a bit better. Hopefully we don't. But what's interesting is June and July is sort of the end of the first round of the Paycheck Protection Program. So if people are on, if that helped people get by, that's great. If it was truly a crutch for people, you may see some problems there. Um, July 15, you've got your tax returns due. So we could, you know, last September we saw some liquidity crises in the markets with, um, you know, right around that tax payment. And that's when the Fed started their reverse um, repo operations and injecting lots and lots of liquidity into the space, actually last September, long before COVID. So just watching any kind of liquidity changes um, around that tax payment date. July 31st, you've got the $600 a week. Um, those, you know, that extra $600 a week for the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Um, that's going to end. That's a political discussion so far. I believe the White House is not pushing back on that. It's interesting because you and I have had this conversation via email, but also even the Fed has come out to say it's really not incentivizing people to go back to work if they're making more not working. Um, so, but we could, that, that extra $600 a week probably participated in some of the, uh, you know, consumer spending, the consumer discretionary, and those numbers and any of the numbers that kind of didn't go down as much as we would expect, um, you know, that $600 a week goes away, that could, that could affect the spending. Uh, then you've got, you know, October 31st, you've got the furlough period for mortgages and things like that going away. So you've got about 5 million people taking advantage of that. So those people are either going to stop spending elsewhere and pay their mortgage, 
So that could kind of, uh, you know, affect some of the consumerism going on, or they're going to default on their mortgage, which we can get into real estate and what might occur there. So these are kind of the bumps that we have to get through where we have data that, you know, unemployment data that continues to decline. And that will sort of, you know, determine the trajectory going forward. And, you know, is this a hurricane? Is this a blip in the universe and we're all back to normal? I mean, if you look at some of the credit ETFs and things like that, they're just, you know, they're absolutely discounting um, pandemic. <laughs> just saying it doesn't, you know, they're, they're almost back to normal basically saying that pandemic was just a blip in the road. So the thing is, that's the thing. Now you look at Delta Airlines. So Delta Airlines, you know, travel still being down 80%. They're looking at, you know, buying out some of their employees' contracts or letting their pilots, particularly the unionized pilots, retire early. And so they're giving them 26, 20 to 26 weeks of, benef um, of severance pay um, you know, a year or two, depending on the particular deal of medical coverage. And then, you know, they're going to give them some travel benefits to try and incentivize them to go, kind of going off the payroll because, you know, does Zoom really take over the business travel? So you see these different indicators, but those are the risks in the system to watch. It's basically those dates when these programs and this assistance changes, obviously a second wave in COVID, but also just sectors of the economy that maybe aren't going to get back to normal quite as quickly like airlines uh american airlines is probably going to get rid of 30 percent of its you know executive and administrative workforce which is about five thousand employees that's a lot yeah. so that's what i'm watching well th these are great great comments and um uh appreciate all the data points so one quick just just comment on what you said Everything I heard, there is a bipartisan support to create an incentive program for people to go back to work rather than collect the checks. So the 600 bucks a week, uh, it'd be great to get an extension, and it certainly supports uh, people's ability to spend money. Uh, but it would be so much better to give employers and employees incentives to to to, to go back to work. I mean, that that's the ultimate goal, because the economy you know, doesn't want to function on a bunch of uh, these subsidy checks, rather uh, it would be much better to have people working. And then the other point, she said a very, very interesting point is the, the end of forbearance, and that's going to impact the real estate. It's, it's, it's funny what, what's been happening in residential real estate. The uh, supply of houses in the market have been really short and the demand decent and the prices have kept up. Uh, but one of the risks that people are talking about is that end of forbearance and this COVID uh, fear subsides and things reopen, more inventory will hit. On the commercial front, I just would love to hear your point, your thoughts on the commercial front. Uh, there's been a lot of forbearances too um, uh, by the distressed borrowers that requested most banks have granted some level of relief. And those are projected to run out in, you know, in the fall as well. So what do you think is going to happen again? Um, yeah, crystal ball is hard to find, uh, but you, your best guess projection. Well, in, in or... real estate, I think when, you, when you're just looking at real estate particularly, you know, you've got credit tightening. Um, the application rejection rates are going up. Um, you've got, again, you know, 5 million-ish loans in forbearance. You've got delinquency rates doubling. Um, you know, you've already got kind of these supply conditions tightening, but it's just how many people can afford the loans to buy the tightening supply. So it might put some, you know, anytime you have diminishing supply, you have an upward trajectory on price. But if your buyers are also diminishing because of their ability to qualify for loans as these credit markets tighten, um, you know, that could also kind of change that. Um, you know, you've got obviously horrible job loss. Um, you've got a declining international demand because of kind of the craziness that's happening with travel. Um, so, you know, you've got these constraints that are coming along and it's just, it's, it's hard to have a crystal ball, but these are the things, you know, when I see upticks in any one of these little areas, these are the things that I'm watching for as far as increasing risk. Um, and the thing that's funny is obviously rates are going down, down, down the fed funds, you know, the fed, um, investors are pricing in negative rates, you know, which is the Fed has obviously said they're not going to do negative rates. I don't know. That remains to be seen. I think England was saying that they were not going to do negative rates and 
now they're sort of flirting with the idea. Uh, negative rates is only beneficial when you're comparing it to default. But in any case, um, you know, people, you know, obviously lower rates usually support, supports the real estate market. But in a situation where you don't have banks willing to lend, then that kind of constrains that area of it. So you might not see the traditional reaction to the rates falling. So uh, great for the comments. I remember we were chatting and you, you were doing some work a while, while, while back, um, how to prevent rates from going negative. <laughs> so oh, yes. You, 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 you had the foresight to, uh, to worry about this a while back when the rates were a you know, good amount higher. Well, it's funny. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, I did. I'm still working on that, actually. Um, and it's floating around. I, I submitted a proposal to the Bank of England, and now I'm kind of working on other ways of kind of who to take my ideas to. So everybody's so overwhelmed with COVID, they don't really want to have this discussion right now. But what's interesting is it was based on, you know, the sovereign debt loads and when those are going to become onerous. And of course, we've done nothing but add to the sovereign debt loads since COVID. So I think, I think there will be a time when my ideas will be very interesting. I mean, at, at this point in the United States, we're still sort of, you know, saying that our rates are not going to go negative. But um, obviously, you know, rates go negative when debt service becomes untenable. And it's sort of a de facto redistribution of wealth because it takes the benefit from the creditor to the debtor. And those sorts of things happen um, in eras where, you know, the debtors can't can't meet the loan obligations. And I think we're going to see a wave of, you know, credit ratings dropping and defaults occurring that's going to last, you know, does it really hit in the third quarter? Does it really hit in the fourth quarter? And it will just depend on how, how large it is as to whether it affects the economy, because you've got so many trillions of dollars of stimulus now that, for instance, let's just say you take the China trade deal off of the table, or you have like a $100 billion fluctuation in that deal, um, in the balance of payments and in tariffs, what have you. And it's just a blip compared to the multi-trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that are sitting in, you know, that are basically new liquidity in the marketplace. So anything with credit ratings, defaults, restructurings, it's all going to be about the numbers and how, what kind of a dent do those numbers put in the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of stimulus. So of course, market people are pretty happy to say, even if those problems arise, then it's not going to put a huge, it's not going to put enough of a dent in those trillions. And the difference between this crisis and previous crises is the fact that, you know, the Fed and, you know, the fiscal response from the administration and Congress has been stronger earlier than ever before. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Well, couple, so these are great points. A couple of quick further uh, questions. So uh, let's now go into Fed because the the, uh, the stimulus has been massive, uh, one president proportion. But now Fed action has been. If I if I got the data correctly, Fed was buying 28 times higher. They were buying um, 79 billion a day uh, during the peak of the crisis. Uh, in this cycle versus the previous, the 2008-9 uh, cycle that we're doing 82 a month. So it's fascinating that the, the Fed action has been swift in, in the, when I ran the math, it was 28 times um, higher. And then they've announced all these uh, Main Street lending facility and the fallen angel, angel programs, where they're buying the debt of the uh, default of, of the of the companies who's uh, getting downgraded into junk bond status. Um, so, what do you think about all this? The, the, the amount announced seems to be staggering, and maybe that's the reason they the, the fear completely subsided, and uh, investors are back back to the um, you know uh, happy uh, happy days into the stock market is, is, is the fat action plus the stimulus completely alleviated fears and i haven't looked at the vix lately but i'm assuming the vix have gone down drastically uh in the last you know couple of weeks oh yes yeah the vix has come off remarkably i mean you had a couple of things there i mean you had the exchanges closed right so they just opened on tuesday partially the nyse did um 
you know, you had the exchanges closed, uh, so you just have to wonder how much trading was eliminated as a result of just not having the greatest internet connections. I mean, the whole premise of high frequency trading is that you're, you know, a foot and a half or six inches closer to the server so that you can get your orders in first. Um, the VIX has backed off to 25, and of course it hit, you know, its all-time high was sort of in the upper 86 range, which of course, oh, let's see what it was, 84, 83. Oh, no, sorry, there's another day that was yeah, higher. It's it, about 86. It's a, huge, it's, a huge, it's a huge drop, but it's not complacency days when it was 12. So it's still still shows right. higher risk, but it, it's not no longer you know, massive risk. It's like there's some level of risk or uncertainty. Right, there but is. Why? I mean, the short-term sentiment is, as you said, it's just follow the Fed. I mean, when have you ever seen markets go rallying off these – off? terrible employment numbers, terrible manufacturing numbers, terrible numbers, you know, um, you've never seen that, you know, markets sell that news. And so it just really goes to say that if the markets are, you know, happy to ignore that data, then they are really counting on the Fed. And the Fed has come to the rescue and said, no matter how bad it gets, we're going to, we'll, we will do whatever it takes. And so I think that's a big reason why the market is up because you see these you know, historic unemployment claims and things like that. And the market just rallies on this news. I mean, the market's up today. <laughs> we had, you know, we've now reached 40 million ish of unemployment claims, which of course, if you, if I had said that several months ago, oh, the market's going to rally on 40 million job losses, you would, you know, you would have me committed immediately. Um, so this is highly unusual activity. The other thing that's really unusual is that the sell-off really only lasted 23 days. So it's the fastest ever. I mean, quintessentially bear markets are 18 to 20 months. Um, so that supports the V-shaped recovery. The determining factor, of course, will be, as, as popular conversation says, the determining factor is going to be, you know, now that the Fed has successfully shored the liquidity, do you go from a liquidity problem to a solvency issue? And that's where you're going to have to confront the, you know, continuous, you know, what percentage of the unemployment claims do become permanent job losses? What percentage of those people who qualified for mortgages under better standards after the financial crisis now would not qualify for those mortgages? So they're going to default. And what other percentage of debt do they default on? And then, you know, what percentage of companies, you know, small companies, I mean, there was a statistic at the beginning of COVID. Um, so now we're kind of hitting in some areas, you know, I think it's going to be longer before economies reopen, but it's going to be interesting to see which percentage of businesses open. I heard another scary statistic that in New York City, which you'd probably know better than I, um, you know, 30 to 40% of the restaurants will never open their doors again. So we'll just have to see if that becomes a reality. And then how many of those people that never reopen their doors again actually default somewhere in credit land? And how big is that wave? And how big of a shock is that to the system? And it's really interesting because now some economists are sort of expecting a little tiny, I mean, the Fed is not concerned about inflation. And certainly I think that the deflationary risks are still bigger than the inflationary risks. But, you know, it's funny on Bloomberg um, yesterday, uh, John Williams, who's the president of the New York Fed was interviewed. And it was funny because the interviewer said, now what happens if these interest rates tick up you know, what happens to all the securities and all the debt that the Treasury has purchased, you know, borrowed from the Fed via the special purpose vehicle, traded at BlackRock, you know, all these unusual things, um, you know, will they endure losses? Now, they've come out and said that they publicly that they, they will endure losses. It's not a big deal. Um, but, you know, these questions become bigger, the bigger the losses. And it's funny, uh, John Williams skirted that question quite nicely, because it is something out there that, you know, is a potential risk that, we don't know what's going to happen. He doesn't necessarily know what's going to happen. So those are the things to watch going forward. As far as the stock market goes, um, we were just having a, uh, an investment committee meeting and um, there were some technical signals in for technical analysts that this could have been a bull. And the biggest thing was the April um, 1st, April 2nd, April 3rd sort of island, which uh, old technical analysis says that it's called an island reversal. But that was kind of the first really bullish signal. And that was right around 2,500 on the S&P 500. And again, very hard to spot at the time. 
but very obvious in retrospect, as most things are with the market. I think the market will, you know, basically has the worst of the worst of the worst, and the Fed will bail us out priced in. So you're going to have to see some kind of surprise in the news. Um, loss of a China trade deal, maybe. Again, what, what, what are the numbers? Um, but a second wave of coronavirus, for sure. Otherwise, it's off to the races for the markets. Yeah, this is such a brilliant assessment. I, I mean, I, I greatly appreciate uh, your wisdom here. And I have to say that I, I, you know, being in New York and having family members, including myself, gone through the virus, um, I, I had it without even knowing. Um, I just tested for antibodies. But I have uh, close relatives who have gone through it. And uh, I have to say that um, I am concerned about second wave. Um, and, and then as far as the statistic that you mentioned, that the 42% of people who are on unemployment now will never come back, it is a uh, fundamentally scary number. So for now, they're getting liquidity to pay the rent and to pay for the for food and to stay afloat for now. But it is a uh, uh, fundamentally um, uh, concerning uh number that may we might wind up with at eight, nine, ten, eleven percent unemployment after things restabilize. Uh and then all this triggering of defaults. I, I heard a worse number for New York. Um so you said thirty to forty percent will never reopen. I heard that fifty to seventy percent will actually fail. I mean either they they won't reopen, number one and two, if they reopen, they just won't survive. So it's wow. it's uh it's an yeah, it's you know speculation. Somebody, some analyst somewhere uh, came up with a number, but it is a staggering number. And then the chain effect of um, all those people not having the income and and so on and so forth. And um, but who knows? It's, it's a lot of speculation. And and uh, one thing is that that's that's encouraging is, is is there is a political will right now, election year, uh, plus the the, the Fed policy and. Uh, uh, the comments on the on the Fed taking losses, I, I think it's implied. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. On paper, whether they make or lose money, it is irrelevant. It's just a mechanism for them to inject cash. To to I want to call it, they can, you know, buy fallen angel debt. I don't know what prices they're going to pay for it. My my assumption is they're going to be trying to buy them at the prices that are higher than they should be, if the market uh, had no Fed support. It's almost like. Warren Buffett is sitting now, can't find deals because because Fed stepped in and and he would have had great opportunities if there was no Fed action in essence. So <laughs> it's a it's a bizarre world, but but the distressed opportunity buyers are now sitting with a ton of theoretically raised capital. They just can't seem to um, put it to work because the um, uh, well maybe the deals will come back in the fall uh, when when some of these things run out, but. Now it's just a, at least where, where I, I operate, it feels like a um, little bit of a, f a freeze. Nothing is going on because just people, the financing is hard to find. The buyers don't want to sell the farm or give away the farm and the sellers. Sorry, the, the sellers don't want to give away the farm and the buyers don't want to pay the same price. So it's an interesting world where uh, the transaction volume, and I don't know what, what you're seeing, sort of has gone down and it probably will come back up. It just feels like it's going to be a slow process. Any yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, for me, it's all these little gears are, are, you know, spinning in this machine in the economy, right? And these couple little gears just break or stop or slow down. And initially it doesn't have a huge effect, but then eventually it has sort of a chain reaction. And we just don't know how big that chain reaction is going to be. And that's kind of the thing to watch. I do expect, you know, unless we have bad news, I do expect the markets to go up. What the markets are kind of pricing in um, is the fact that on the back of the worst growth in the history of ever for Q2, in Q3, economists are projecting that, you know, we're growing, you know, these crazy numbers that, you know, never before GDP growth in the third quarter. So what's funny is the market is just completely trading because markets anticipate things and they're usually early. Um, they're just trading that third quarter growth. I mean, I've heard divergent numbers, so I don't even really have a good number to quote, but it's just supposed to be unprecedented. 
what will happen is the markets will sell off substantially if that doesn't actually follow through because the economy doesn't turn on like a light switch. But for the time being, that's what the market's pricing in and that's why the market is up so high. And I see that happening until some of the reality points, which we cannot now predict how many people are going to default on their mortgages. So the market's not trading it because you can't predict it. Um, some of these things, you know, until that news comes out, I see the markets moving higher, but when that news comes out, watch out below because, you know, it could make a substantial difference into what's being priced in the marketplace now. And we just don't know. It's like New York. Okay. How many businesses that reopen are then going to fail? No data. And as you and I know, everybody's discounted cash flows, you know, the variables that people are plugging in, those numbers are just so different that you just don't have a general consensus. So what's the market plugging in? It's plugging in data that it thinks it can think with, which is just massive amounts of GDP growth in the third quarter. And it's just not plugging in data where you can't get a good number. And I think that's why we're seeing a massive upswing in the markets in the face of, as you say, the real economy. Obviously, the numbers are horrifying. Yeah, that's uh, that's a, that's a great way to uh, represent what's happening with the market versus the economy. And um, yeah, I've had I've heard all kinds of other. Well, there are as many opinions as there are people, and uh, and as there are economists. And some people still believe that there is a retesting of the bottom, although uh, it, it would have to be like you're saying, really bad data coming in the fall. And until the fall. There's some level of optimism. Q3 will be good, and Q3 will be good. But until these numbers are reported, and then these defaults kicking in, so uh, you, you, you're probably right that the stock market will do a happy dance for you know a good amount of time until some real data is going to scare people or, or give them a reality shock. I mean, I could so, be wrong. <laughs> so, but the thing that's the thing that's just immensely interesting is that. Um, yeah, the market, you know, I, I, see, I could see it going up. We're pretty close to there now, testing 31 and a quarter on the S&P 500 and then seeing sort of what it does there. But yeah, until we get new data that is in a disagreement with the fact that the economy is going to turn on like a light switch. I mean, it's funny because airlines, you know, Delta's looking to, you know, get rid of so many of its employees. And yet at the same time, the fact that uh, they you know, are, are getting rid of employees. But if you look at the airline stocks and the travel stocks, you know, they were so lagging sort of the tech stocks that some of that, obviously the cyclical recovery is coming in and the bank stocks and the travel stocks are coming in to kind of meet that tech stock movement. So that normally would be a very good sign. But again, there's just a lot of data that's lacking. And the S&P could sell back off to 2,500, which would not be a new low. Um, but it would be kind of a meaningful pullback and look for support at 2,500 and it would be a much higher low. And, you know, it just depends on the data that comes through, but that's not completely unthinkable. And that, that would be a good place for people to jump in and buy who missed the bottom, which most people that I know missed the bottom. I mean, it came in 23 days and then it was back up remarkably off of the low in about 14 or 16 days. Um, you know, so not very many people made that trade, but, you know, you'll get another opportunity probably when some of the more, you know, surprising data comes in. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sitting and waiting for it because I can tell you that I, I, so that's the reason I do real estate, not the stock market, because I've done, because I call it the dumbest thing, well, not the dumbest thing ever, but as the market bounced back, I sold off a bunch of stuff expecting uh, that it was a temporary dead cat bounce. <laughs> yeah. And it was off. And now it's kind of a bunch, a bunch of you know steps up, and then I'm sitting paralyzed. I don't know. A lot of investors are probably in the same shoes. They're sitting paralyzed, thinking, "Hey, I missed the boat." And then now it's a scary time to go back in because it's recovered so much. The real economic data is, in my view, is a whole lot scarier than uh, the stock market is telling us. So. It's it's a hard place to be if you're trying to get back in unless you're a professional and you 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 have uh, you know a good plan what to do. For most people, it's a little bit of a weird situation where um, hard to pull the trigger and get back in because they missed the boat the last twenty percent recovery. So it's a it's a bizarre place to be, uh, but uh, it's you know. <laughs> Like you said, there are a lot of people who have done this. A uh, couple of final thoughts. We were, we're past the time. Greatly appreciate your wisdom and, and, and sharing. Um, 
So any parting thoughts, uh, anything else, anything you want to add? Again, it's, again, so great to have you. would love to have you back again. Um, uh, any thoughts on um, what people should or could do if they, they're not, you know, is there a place to park the money anywhere temporarily, or this is more of a, you know, wait and see uh, type of environment, or you know, should people still? Again, I, I invest in real estate, and I think the opportunities in real estate are beginning to reopen, and we're beginning to see some deals. Although majority of really good deals are, are, are sort of in a waiting mode until some of these defaults take place. Um, yeah. So in real same, estate. Yeah, in real estate, you have to wait because who knows what that data is going to look like. I mean, I personally wouldn't go um, pay pre-COVID prices, which some places are optimistic about pre-COVID prices. I personally wouldn't do that until I saw more about when the, what the defaults look like. I mean, yeah, of course you can miss it, you know, but again, the real employment and how many of those people are going to default on their mortgages and stuff like that and the tightening and the lending and, you know, they're just some risks in that long-term transaction. Um, Markets, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy the markets unless they pull back, you know, five or ten percent, and I, I don't think that's unheard of. Um, so I, I would kind of just be patient. If you're one of those people that's just sitting there with cash on the sidelines, I mean, we could go see thirty-one and a quarter, but you know, at that point, we're going to be seeing some kind of substantial resistance. Um, if it gets back above thirty-one and a quarter, you're getting near the all-time highs, and of course. The economy looks nothing like it did at that time period. So the further departure from reality, you know, um, the riskier it is, basically. So if you want to jump in and chase it to 31 and a quarter and see if it starts closing above that on the S&P 500, great. But the better thing to do is wait till it sells off, see if it finds some support at 28.12 or 26.56, and right there would be a decent buy. And if it fails there, I could see this market going back down to retest 2,500. So it just depends on how patient you are. But I think if you get back into the market, just be ready to get out of the market. I think you just have to pay more attention than you normally would. And uh, unfortunately, markets oh, anticipate things. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to trade the bad news and the good news before it comes out. So you just kind of have to keep an eye on it. Yeah, I hear it. It's more of a trader's game versus a long-term investor now. But one question is, just given current valuations, so given the PEs, uh, does it feel like we're paying a much higher price uh, for dollar or projected earnings uh, today versus pre-COVID? Because pre-COVID, the projections were high, and people were paying high prices. Now, we almost recovered the pre-COVID level, and it's been an even recovery, obviously. The, the market leaders... The, the players in the internet world, the e-commerce, they, 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 you know, the leaders kept leading and they, they, they blew through their highs in some, in some you know, instances. And then the losers are probably stuck in the loser situations. Um, it, the airline industry and the cruise industry is fascinating to me from the fact that they bounced back somewhat uh, because their real short-term prospects are just horrible. And the long-term prospects, it, it, it's really, you know, many, many months away before the sum returned to normalcy. Um, but so what do you think, just valuation? Is the market feels like it's, it's, more, it's more overvalued now than pre-COVID based on P projections? What do you, how, well, I think it was overvalued. Um, I think it was overvalued pre-COVID because remember, we, really the peak in earnings growth was in the third quarter of 2018. So, you know, the earnings growth had already been in kind of an earnings recession um, you know, since the peak in 2018. So the value, it was overvalued then. And then you add COVID into the picture and it's certainly overvalued. One of the reasons that the stock prices kept heading higher, despite the fact that the, you were starting to have a bit of an earnings recession is because there were so many buybacks, you know, and that became one of those political issues. You can't take government loans out and buy back your shares. But anyway, um, so you know, stock buybacks and things like that would have to kind of come into play. But at this point, no, it doesn't make sense. I mean, where we are valuation wise and where we are economically, there's going to be some reversion to the mean at some point. I don't know exactly when it's going to occur, but you know, that's, that's kind of my thing as I'm looking back for the S and P to kind of go back down to 2,500 and test that there's a gap from April, April 3rd at 2538. I would have thought it would have done it by now, but um, no, I think we're terribly overvalued as far as 
you know, and the thing that's interesting is that you've had some pop in the small cap and you've had some stock in the value and you've had some pop sort of in some of the international markets and those things have been depressed for so long um, that those are cheaper. So, you know, it's not surprising that this week we've seen some rotation into some of those places that were much cheaper than obviously the FANG stocks, which, you know, basically have carried the indices much higher. So it's going to be interesting to see what occurs. But yes, valuations are pretty high, which goes to our previous point of being a little bit more tactical or active in your investing than strategic or long-term investor. Francis, that's a great uh, point. And, and uh, I share the view. We're overvalued nonetheless. It can keep rolling forward and people could keep paying higher prices because they got well the other sort of uh you know we are things where else people can put the money unless they're comfortable putting them in the alternatives the bond yields have gone so low and almost like can you can you make any money in bonds ever uh, at all yeah. unless the rates go negative <laughs> right right so, well it's that's the thing and unless you have access and wherewithal i mean we do 50 percent in alternatives you know in our investment house but that's unusual. And most people are going, most people didn't sell on the way down and they're not going to sell anything and they're going to ride the thing back up and back down and back up again. That's just most people. But if you're out there with some cash on the sidelines, I would wait for, you know, somewhat of a pullback on the S and P 500 and we may not get it for a while. I mean, it could trade higher through the summer. Um, obviously historically traders and people take kind of a break in August and it could get crazy again back in September, but uh, I wouldn't be in a rush to buy when it's, you know, going up in a straight line, because just historically and from a probability perspective, you know, markets that are up have more of a probability than going down. <laughs> so even if just a little bit. And so I would buy dips and not buy on all time highs for sure. Thank you kindly for your wisdom. Thank you for coming as a guest. Uh, is there a place if folks wanted to reach out to you? Um, uh, I don't know, invite you as, 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 a, as a guest and then a speaker at their event or, or, or something like that. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Obviously, don't give away any private information. Is there a way for folks to reach out to you? No, I think, I think just going to Optimal Capital and um, you can call the office and reach out to me that, you know, that way if you have questions. And then, you know, I, they can pass along the messages and I can get back to as many people as I can get back to. I mean, it just depends. Sometimes I have a few people call and I'm happy to get back and answer all their questions. And sometimes I'm absolutely bombarded with, it just depends from appearance to appearance. But yeah, I would just, I, you know, if you have curiosity about what we do and what I do and, you know, how, you know, optimal capital, our portfolios were only down 8% when the market was down, you know, 30 plus percent. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's pretty significant. So if you have questions about that sort of thing, then you can just call up Optimal Capital and it's, you can just Google it. Uh, that's Optimal Capital uh, Advisors, right? It's OptimalCapital.com. Got it. Okay. Thank you kindly for sharing yeah. again. Thank yes. you so much for being a guest. Stay well, stay safe. Um, good luck to your husband with the racing. Uh, and, um, Let's do this again, and hope we have a we have a good summer. Enjoy your yes. summer. Yes, absolutely. You too. Stay well and keep your family well, and hopefully, I get to come back to New York and see you soon. Absolutely, would love to have you back, and then break some bread again. Yes, I would love it. Okay, Mike, have a great day. Thank you, friend. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. To receive your copy of Mike's How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Fun Book, head to BigMikeFun.com or visit Amazon and type Mike Zlotnick. Keep listening and keep investing Big Mike style. See you on the next episode.